There we go. All right. Well, hello, and welcome to the American Revolution, the real American Revolution, a public television uh, series devoted to interviewing authors and historians about what really happened during our American Revolution. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and this program is brought to you by two nonprofit entities, the Real American Revolution and the American Revolution for Civic Education. Now, today, today my guest is John Jack Buchanan. Jack is one of the nation's foremost historians on the American Revolution and is affectionately known as the Dean of the Southern Campaigns. Now, his books on the American Revolution include the prize-winning The Road to Valley Forge, How Washington Built the Army That Won the Revolution, and also the widely acclaimed The Road to Guilford Courthouse, The American Revolution in the Carolinas. Now, Jack's most recent book, The Road to Charleston, Nathaniel Green and the American Revolution, uh, it's become a huge bestseller. So this is a second in a series of interviews with Jack to discuss his books. And today we're going to be focusing on the road to Guilford Courthouse, the American Revolution in the Carolinas. So Jack, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> well, Jack, it's been my experience that Americans know very little about the American Revolution in the South. And so perhaps maybe we can kind of lead into the uh, discussion by providing kind of a brief background. Now, Following the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey, on June 28, 1778, when the British were basically vacating Philadelphia and marching back to New York City, they specifically turned their attention thereafter to the South. Now, during the next two years after Monmouth, uh, 1778 and 79, the British captured Savannah, as you know, and achieved a major victory with a great capturing another great Southern port when Charleston fell in 1780. But we both know that the American Revolution in the South really began much earlier than 1778. There was unrest in the South, just as there was unrest in New England and the Mid-Atlantic regions. So before we focus on the British actually turning their attention to the South, let's talk about the situation in the South or in the Southern colonies before 1778. And at the outset of your book, you talk about the Rice Kings. Who exactly were the Rice Kings and why did they rebel? And then what happened in the Carolinas and Georgia between 1775 and 1778? The Rice Kings were men of property, owned great rice and indigo plantations and gangs of slaves. And they, they had become rich quickly. The, the, the uh, South Carolina especially had been settled early in the 18th century, and by mid and even earlier 18th century, these men were rich and powerful. Yet, they were looked down upon by the ruling class of England, the men who ran England, the, the aristocrats, and uh, treated as colonials. And, but these men were proud, they were arrogant, and they decided that there was no other earthly power that could rule their, their lands and themselves than they. They wanted to rule themselves, and so they rebelled against the mother country. It, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Uh, uh, one, one, one of the rice kings said he shed a tear for the mother country and all the Englishman that I love, but he still rebelled. So they rebelled against the English. They also had to, had to count on the tradesmen and the mechanics of Charleston in order, to, in, in order for a successful rebellion. And they looked down on these men, just, just as the English aristocracy, the ruling class, looked down upon them. They looked down upon the tradesmen and the mechanics of uh, what, what, what one of the uh, one of the rice kings said, uh, how could such men hope to be hope to be legislators and and governors? Mm -hmm. They they looked absolutely looked down upon them, mm -hmm. but they um, with the tradesmen and mechanics they rebelled. They took over. They put down a rising of loyalists between 1770 and 1775. They led a military campaign in the back country against the loyalists, put them down, and from 1775 to 
1778, they ruled in the, in, in the Carolinas and Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now, North Carolina, we have to remember, uh, was, was independent right from the beginning. The North Carolina legislature um, was in session throughout the revolution with a slight hiccup that we may come to, uh, but they were in, 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 in session throughout the revolution. South mm -hmm. Carolina was overthrown by the British. So was Georgia. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so. interesting. Well, beginning with Lexington and Concord and Breeds Hill, from 1775 to really the summer of 1778, the fighting took place largely in the North. Why did the British turn their attention to the South? Three reasons. Uh, they've been thinking of a Southern campaign since 1776. Um, but the three reasons they turned South, first, stalemate in the North after the Battle of Monmouth in the summer of 1778. That was the first reason. The second reason was that George III and his ministry had been importuned by Tories, loyalists, and especially ro uh, uh, royalist governors in exile, that there were vast numbers, vast numbers of loyalists in the South who would rise once a British army arrived. Mm -hmm. The third reason, which is often not talked about, and Lord Germain reminded Sir Henry Clinton just before the expedition that went south, that to be aware of the safety of our West India colonies, our West Indian islands, the Sugar Islands, which according to British merchants in London and plantation owners in Jamaica and other islands were more important than the mainland. So those were the three reasons mm -hmm. why the British turned south. Well, that would explain also then why they, uh, why they really went to Charleston and Savannah, because they were major ports that yes. interacted with the West Indies. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Well, where did the British first invade in the South, and what happened initially when they did that? They invaded Georgia at the tail end of 1778. Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Campbell with 3,000 British regulars landed on the Georgia coast, and that day took Savannah. In one day? In one day, he took Savannah. Uh, uh, General Robert Howe was the American commander in chief in the South at the time and uh, was not up to the job. And, and in fact, in his report uh, after the battle, he revealed that he hadn't a clue as to what had happened. How had this happened? He had lost Savannah. And then several days thereafter, um, a, 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 a British expeditionary force of about 1,000 British and, uh, and loyalist regulars with militia marched into the back country. And, and, and that, is, that brings us to a very interesting point. The, his commander wrote that the test of this expedition is to is, is to test the loyalty of the backcountry and the professions of their loyalty. 6,000 loyalist fighters have been promised to Campbell. Mm -hmm. 1,000 to 1,400 showed up. They had also been promised legions of Indian auxiliaries coming in from the West. And these will be the Creek Indians or the Muscogee. Not one Indian appeared. Mm. And about a year after that, Lord Cornwallis wrote, who by then was in command in the South, of British forces in the South, the, the control of the backcountry is of the utmost importance. It mm -hmm. our, our success in the Southern District depends totally upon it. Why? Because the majority three quarters of the white population of the South lived in the Georgia and Carolina back countries. Mm -hmm. Well, the back country was really important, but why did the back country 
rise against the, uh, the, uh, the invasion, particularly in 1780 when the British came in. They captured uh, Charleston, uh, of course, and uh, the Charleston fell in May of 1780. And it just seemed to me that uh, the British were going full throttle. Uh, well, they were. They were. So, so how did the back country rise up against that? Well, first, all of South Carolina was shot by the fall of Charleston and then the march of British regulars uh, up country. Um, in my opinion, the, the settlers in the back country coming in, immigrating from the port of Charleston, and then all these Scotch-Irish coming down from Pennsylvania along the Great Wagon Trail and the, and the Catawba trading path uh, into, in, in, into South Carolina. These were people who had been in America for a generation or more. Uh, some were Ulster born, but many had been born in this country. And to them, the British, the, the mother country was far, far away. They, they were accustomed to governing themselves. And in my opinion, this, this custom of, being, of governing themselves uh, took precedence over, over a boss 3,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so they rebelled. Mm -hmm. and pretty and, effectively. And pretty effectively. You see, all, what the colonists were asking was home rule. Home rule. Especially taxation because they weren't represented in parliament. And they thought only taxation could be exacted by their local, by their local assemblies, mm -hmm. state by state, and, and other matters of home rule. The British would continue to handle foreign relations, military matters, but they would have home rule. Uh, the British didn't come, uh, Britain didn't come around to this until 1867 when they passed the British North American Act giving Canada home rule. In the 18th century was too early. They weren't ready for it. Interesting. The Americans were, the Brits weren't. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were the numbers between say the, the Tories and the uh, and the rebels in the back country? What, how did that break out number wise? There was a British Tory officer who, who left his journal, Colonel Robert Gray. Uh, he reckoned that the T Tories in South Carolina alone numbered about two thirds. The, the um, rebels, about three quarters. He thought in the 96th dis district in the far back country that there were, um, oh, that they were about even, Tories and rebels. That in the Orangeburg district, in the mid back country, the Tories might have been slightly superior, but on the whole, about two thirds, or only, uh, I'm sorry, not two thirds, about a third, about a third of, of, of the population were Tories. Mm -hmm. A modern student, Robert Stansbury Lambert, uh, in his book on the Loyalists in, uh, in South Carolina, he came up with a 22% figure, 22% of Tories. The Tories, you see, th 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 this, this myth that had been fed to, um, to, uh, the, um, to the king and to his ministers, that the Tories would rise in vast numbers just wasn't true. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true. Interesting. What's been said at the Southern backcountry rebels really kind of invented a new type of fighting. Now, is this really true? And what did the backcountry rebels accomplish? Um, no, it's not true. Um, although it, it has been published and some people believe it, it was guerrilla fighting. It was guerrilla fighting, which we know that we have, we today know that so well. You know, from Vietnam, uh, the British know it from Kenya. Uh, it's been happening all over the world. Guerrilla fighting 
goes back to ancient times, probably in prehistory, before recorded history. It was simply guerrilla fighting. Uh, the, 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 famous, the famous fight in 1775, when the British were retreating from Lexington and Concord, the Massachusetts militia used guerrilla fighting to combat them. Um, so there was no new method of fighting. But the one difference, the one difference between uh, northern guerrilla fighting during the revolution and southern guerrilla fighting, the southern, with one exception, the southern guerrillas were mounted. And so they had mobility. Lord Rawdon, who, who took over command uh, of British forces uh, in, in South Carolina on what the British called the frontier after Cornwallis went north in, 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 in pursuit of, of, of uh, Morgan and Green. Lord Rawdon said, their mobility is the reason we have never been able to bring them to a decisive action. The, the only example of that in the north is in a county just north of New York City, Westchester County, where two groups, the Cowboys and the Skinners, the Cowboys were Tories, the Skinners were rebels, were mounted. That's the only example in the North that I know of, that I know of. Interesting, interesting. Well, there were some pretty effective guerrilla leaders that you've underscored in your book and you've highlighted, such as Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter and, and uh, Andrew Pickens, also Elijah Clark. Uh, were there others that complemented them, or were they the major ones? They were the, they were the major ones. Um, the triumvirate is, is usually spoken of as Marion, Sumter, and Pickens. Uh, Elijah Clark hasn't got as much uh, press <laughs> in the <laughs> historical media as the other three. But he was a ferocious fighter. Uh, you know, at the Battle of Musgrove's Mill, uh, According, according to a friend of, Elijah, uh, of, of Isaac Shelby, uh, who was one of the colonels there, Shelby stops in the middle of battle and looks in awe at the ferocious fighting ability of, of Elijah Clark, you know, this uh, illiterate backcountry uh, fighter. Uh, but no, those were the three. And then there were the Roebucks and, uh, and others uh, second, secondary fighters, uh, but who were just as important, but those were the three who got the historical press, Marion, Sumter, and Pickens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Jack, we got one final question here. What's yeah. the one takeaway from the road to Guilford Courthouse that really every American needs to know? You know, what happened, what really happened in comparison to what's been lost to history or what's been perpetuated in myth? We have so many myths about the American Revolution, but what's, uh, what does every American need to know about the road to Guilford Courthouse? Well, I, I would like to address a new myth that is being promulgated by a fairly large coterie of historians and also by the 1619 Project of the New York Times. And I don't mean to sound like some you know, way off radical or anything. I read the New York Times every day. I live in New York City. I read the New York Times every day. It's a great newspaper, great coverage. This myth that newly born because of present concerns that the American Revolution occurred to protect slavery. Hogwash. Hogwash to put it politely, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that's not why the American Revolution occurred. It was not to protect slavery. Uh, that, that is one thing I would take away from, from all of my books. Um, it was about freedom. It was about freedom, it was about home rule, and it was not to protect slavery. That's what I would like to take away from all of my books. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Well, 
Now, you've certainly provided us with a great insight, and uh, I love the road to Guilford Courthouse. From the first time I read it, I recognized it, and talking with other historians, I really recognized that the road to Guilford Courthouse was our Bible to the Southern campaigns. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> There's no question about it. I mean, you want to know what happened, really happened in the South, and you've got to read Jack Buchanan's road to Guilford Courthouse. Well, you know, one of the reasons I wrote it, um, a lot of Americans, all they know about Cornwallis is he surrendered at Yorktown. But the question is, what, hap what happened to him before Yorktown? Where was he? What was he doing? And that's one of the reasons that led me to write the road to Guilford Courthouse. Well, excellent. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great uh, guide for all of us who have an interest in particularly the Southern campaigns or those of us who've been specializing in that particular area of history. So, well, Jack, that looks like all the time we have today. So thanks so much for taking time to join us for Thank a delightful for discussion. Me. And uh, folks, the road to Guilford Courthouse, the American Revolution in the Carolinas is available from Amazon and other outlets. And if you want to know everything you need to know about the war in the South, this is the book that you want, The Road to Guilford Courthouse. Now, today our guest has been author and historian Jack Buchanan. So join us again when the Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education interview other outstanding historians about the real American Revolution. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks so much.